what's good y'all and welcome to my review for AEW Revolution. Also, pretty sure this also marks my final AEW uh, review that I am doing because as you guys know, um, rest that, you know, guys, uh, WrestleMania 40 is going to be my final wrestling review. So, you know, that's when I'm going to stop doing them. Like I mentioned in previous videos, it's just not fun for me anymore. Um, it's just a, and it's honestly just a bitch to record these, honestly, so late in the night and all that jazz. But, um... Yeah, man. So, so, yeah, this is probably... I mean, they did announce a new show coming out in April called Dance Destiny, and I don't know where that airs in, ter in terms of WrestleMania 40. I think WrestleMania 40 airs before that show comes out, so I probably won't be reviewing it, but obviously I'll be watching and everything, but yeah. But yeah, hell of a show to end my time reviewing AEW shows. Guys, I've been there doing this since the beginning, since that first Double or Nothing, man, because this was an incredible show, man. Like, obviously the big thing with this one was Sting's retirement match, was which was a hell of a match in and of itself, even though Jesus Christ, Darby could have gotten himself killed again, but you know, what, what else is new with that? But yeah, man, this was an incredible show, a lot of amazing matches, man, and obviously Sting's retirement match as well, man, but yeah, man, let's just jump right in, starting off with the eight, with the TNT Championship match between Christian and, D uh, and Daniel Garcia. This was a phenomenal match to start the show off with, and of course, you got Christian, he was put on the offensive for most of the match. Eventually, the match progressed all more. He would go, of course, go into the outside once you know, Daniel got some offense and had a huddle with the rest of the of, of the uh, of, of the uh, fucking um patriarchy with you know uh, with you know Luchasaurus and everybody else. And there was actually one part of the match where it looks like he was going to do Daniel Garcia's dab, but he just ends up just flexing his muscles. And, but eventually, Daniel does get his dance in there where he's like in the where he where where um, Christian is in the corner. He's up. He's like in the corner. Uh, Daniel is up on like the second row, going to, like when you think he's just going to go for the uh, the punches, the punches, and then he just starts doing the pelvic thrust dance on him face on his face, man. That was probably the highlight of the match for me, man. Eventually. Eventually, yeah, Christian's leg would start giving him troubles. Like he would go for that one move where he like gets the opponent on the ropes, like you know, chokes him a little bit, leaps over and then and then slaps him. He didn't do that because of course his leg was bothering, or it was either his leg or his foot, I forget which one, was bothering him, and then he was selling that. So he just guy slid under the bottom over Winfrey, but he obviously countered it. Eventually, eventually, uh, Daddy magically is the guy's name. Um, that that Daniel Garcia has been working. That Daniel Garcia has been uh, been paired with. He comes out there to try and give him some backup, man, because you know, of course, the rest of the patriarchy were getting involved, and they had like this whole thing with uh, Nick Wayne's mom tries to get in there, like tries to slap him, but he managed to catch it, which all oh, lost the guy looked like a miscue because it looks like he didn't like it didn't look right like he had to kind of like look for it for a little bit before he finally got a good grip on it. I don't know if that was meant to be if that was a bit of a miscue or not but he had that but eventually man Christian would of course win the match with the kill switch man this was a fantastic match like I said to start the show next up we had was D. Bryan versus Eddie Kingston for the Continental Championship First of all, I loved how the way this match opened up, where you had two of the AEW's interviewers. One was with one was obviously Renee, and then there was this other random blonde chick. I don't know her name. And the random blonde chick was with D. Bryan. She was like, you know, Tony Schiavone or whoever on commentary. Like, oh yeah, can you get a word with them or whatnot? And she says her thing, and then D. Bryan's music hit, and he just leaves without even acknowledging her. So then we switch over to Renee, who's with Eddie Kingston. Same thing, she's talking, Eddie just leaves. <laughs> like, neither one of them take a moment once their music hits to, like, you know, talk with the interviewer, say anything. They just go right to them. They were all business, which I thought was a nice touch uh, with the match. The match begins obviously deep with Deep Bryan with obviously them feeling each other out for a good chunk of the early parts of the match. Eventually, Deep Bryan would then move on to some Pete Dunn like joint manipulation, even doing that move that uh, you guys know Shayna does, where he like grabs her by their arm, points it up, like put like pins it down on the ground, and where like their elbow is like up to his point up to the air, and then just like kick out, and then just and then and, and then and then just and then just boom, just like slam on it with their foot, and just and just or stop on it, excuse me, with their foot, man. Always, that shit always looks and super nasty, man. That shit always looks super nasty. Eventually, then, which of course, more general manipulation, stuff like that, Eddie Kings would really start just selling off, selling his wrist. And that was what he was doing. Like, there would be other marks match where he tries to, like, counter moves with his arm, forgetting he was hurt. And he's once again, like, super hurt and he keeps, you know, uh, selling it. 
etc. And so eventually, that's match request armor. These two would just go off, man. You would have them like you, there was a bunch of near falls. Like there was like I think it was like a running knee for a pin that was a really close near fall. They just start then they eventually just start slapping each other with like having a, a little bit of a slap off. D. Brian goes for his kicks and then eventually yeah, he like pulls the strap down, being like, "Come on, come on!" Goes for and tries to power out, but manages to block the last one, man. And lock and then manages to counter into a I think the move was called half and half or whatnot. But then D. Brian gets right back up and then hits him with his own like um what the hell was a dragon screw a dragon screw suplex or whatever the move is called i forget exactly what the move was called half and half or something i forget what the uh, exact move was called but events but anyway after all that after that whole exchange deep brian would eventually go for his running knee but eddie keeps it countered with a clothesline into a power bomb for the one two three this is another fantastic match man and another good love of this match is that afterwards um I found this out because JD retweeted this. AEW posted this little clip, at this behind this this backstage clip, once both of them were like, the doctor aren't getting fixed up, Eddie had like a bunch of ice on him, and D. Bryan was like getting his shoulder massaged by one of the doctors there and whatnot, and they were kind of, and Eddie was telling hey, you know, you know, Kyle's come and go, I just want the respect to my peers. D. Bryan said that he's finally, he's finally reached his potential, and there's proud of himself for letting go of his petty bullshit and all that jazz, man. It was a great segment, man. And this is definitely one thing that I like about AEW is that we do get like these more raw, personal moments between the wrestlers after the, after their matches behind the backstage, man. I also kind of wish they do this a little bit more often than they do because I always love these segments, man. But yeah, that was a nice little cherry on top. That was a nice little cherry on top for this, for this Madman. That whole segment was fantastic. Next up, we had this listed a Meat Madness match between Lance Archer, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Wardlow. I'm gonna be real. I did not watch this match at all. I didn't even know this match was even on the card. This was my the match I used to take a break to to finally take care of my laundry. This is what I used this match for. That was this was my laundry break. This was my bathroom break. This was let me get a snack to eat match break match. But yeah, uh, but yeah, Wardlow won the match. But like I said, I don't really have anything because I didn't watch. So I didn't find this match particularly uh, interesting. Anyway, next up we had was Roddy versus Orange Cassidy for the uh, for the All Atlantic or what was it? What the hell was it called? I forget. But this is the uh, the, uh, the fucking um international championship. Excuse me. Now, I still call it the All Atlantic sometimes because that's of course that's what the what the what the uh, uh, what the uh, the, uh, the belt was initially called. Anyway, we saw the match off fast and furious with Roddy going after Orange Cassidy for a good chunk of the match, getting a lot of offensive uh, offensive targeting, obviously targeting the back of Orange Cassidy like he did this one. Move he had him up on the turnbuckle and then kind of like picks him up and then drops him right back down the turnbuckle. That move looked absolutely nasty. There's also the other two where Orange goes for like corpse and grabs him for his pockets, but then, but then, um, Orange, or not Orange, that Roddy then grabs him by his pockets, lifts him up into like a, into like a, into a sort of slam. Another, uh, there was another part of the match I liked where, where Orange grabbed, where Orange was on the outside, on the apron, and he grabbed Roddy and was just kind of bouncing him off between two, uh, between both of the turnbuckles buckles on one side he like smashes his head against one side rush dealer would smash the other one then go back to that one then he would alternate between you know hitting him against the turnbuckle and some punches before just continuously slamming him down onto the um onto the turnbuckle eventually as the match would progress onward Roddy would also hit the would also lock in the stronghold for a good while, man. That movie looked nasty, especially with Orange just selling it because of the of his back injury. Eventually, as ma we would end the match off with with Orange going for the Orange punch, but Roddy would counter into a running knee into his into a suplex where he like drops him down on his knee. I forget what the move, what his finisher is called, and that would win him the match. Now, the interesting part of this match, after of course, besides him winning the uh, the the all the. Um, Inter got the, the international championship was that Kyle O'Reilly is finally back, man. I forget what injury he had. I'm assuming it was like a neck injury or something, given how long he was gone, man. But it's so good to see him. He's still rocking the long hair and the like the beard like he was rocking around the end of his NXT run, which I kind of dig the look, man. Like, I know I'm sure some people like kind of miss him with like he yeah, had like the, the short hair and like very trimmed beard or no exempted beard back from his herb from a majority of his NXT days. But I also kind of dig this new look around the end of his NXT run. And it's I'm kind of glad he's still rocking it now, but. Yeah, it was awesome to see him. Of course, we had this amazing moment between him and Roddy. They, of course, tried to get him to join the Undisputed Kingdom, but Kyle O'Reilly declined. And he looked very emotional, man. Now, I'm assuming it was two reasons. One, obviously, just being back and being there back with Roddy and, of course, the crowd. Everyone saying, welcome back. It was probably emotional for finally making a return. But I don't know. My, but it was also probably selling the whole aspect of, you know, what has happened between them, of course, you know, Adam Cole and NXT and all that jazz. 
So I'm assuming there's some of that. I'm, I'm definitely curious to see what they're going to do with Kyle Riley. And I'm just glad he's finally back when he's healed up from whatever injury he had from like, what was it, like last year or two years ago? He's been gone for quite a long time. But I'm glad that but I'm glad that Kyle Riley is finally back in AEW. And I'm curious to see what they're going to do with him, with Roddy and, a and Adam Cole. And all it did. But yeah, man. glad to finally see that he is back. Next up, we had a tag match between FTR and Cesaro and Mox. This was a great match as well, man. But obviously, the highlight match was, of course, uh, Dash bleeding. This man was bleeding, bleeding, man. Like, you could see blood, like, pouring out of his, uh, like, blood pouring out of his wound. He was bleeding a lot on his face, man. I went back because I didn't initially catch it, um... What initially happened, and it looked like he just ran, like, and what happened seemingly, Cesaro throws him into the, throws him into the post, he falls the outside, and then he just blades himself. Well, it looks like he might have cut a little too deep. He might have cut himself a little too deep, because you can actually see, like, blood, like, pouring out of the wound, man. It looked really nasty, honestly, for most, for a good chunk of the match, man. Like, he was bleeding a lot. Like, I'm looking at one shot right here where he has him in that, where Mox has him like an FTF, man, and he, Jesus, that is a lot of fucking blood. But anyway, man. So, the match of regrets onward, man, like I mentioned before, you got the blood, you had the blood spot in there, you had some other stuff where um, FTR would lack in their finisher, and he and Dash and Dash would go for the pin, but of course Cesaro pulls him out to the outside to, 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 to stop the pin, you had one other time where, Ma, where where Dash was on the top rope, Moth gets up there, man, of course punches him a little bit, scratches out his wound, and then of course bites him like usual, man, but then Dash would spit in his face for his trouble, man, so yeah, this is also probably the only match we've seen in recent memory where Mox didn't bleed first. <laughs> he, this was the first time he did not you did not draw first blood seriously man that is a lot of fucking blood he was bleeding in this match man anyway after all that Mox would go in there for the Death Valley driver locks in a, locks in a sleeper hole at events and Dash passed out with them winning the match like I said this was a great match man a great tag team match man and honestly probably one of the best tag team amazing tag team match honestly probably one of the best ones we got in AEW uh recently man this was a this was a great match man this was a lot of this was a, this was a great match to watch next up was tony storm versus diana Peraz. this was a great match this was a really good match i i enjoyed this one so <laughs> so first of all this whole you guys are already know i've been loving timeless tony storm and all and that whole gimmick she's been rocking with it but i thought this entrance was, was interesting because after diana perrazzo makes her entrance uh tony comes out there but it's but and but tony's in like her normal wrestling gear before she started doing the time of Tony Storm thing. And I'm like, oh, cool. So she actually listened to the opera and said she wanted, like, the real Tony Storm, the one she moved with to America with. So I was like, okay. But then she, like, put her glasses down, and I didn't even recognize it then, but Pete, but they mentioned on commentary that wasn't Tony, was the girl that's been, like, following them, um, for the past few weeks or whatnot, so, and she was dressed up as Tony Storm. And then Tony Storm actually comes out, she's still rocking the whole uh, timeless gimmick. So yeah, she didn't go. We didn't get old school Tony Storm for this night, unfortunately, for anyone that was hoping that we would. But regardless of such, man, these two start feeling each other off the early parts of the match, man. They eventually get like stuck in the corner with with uh, Aubrey Edwards, and she's like, "Hey, yo, back it up, back it up, back it up." But of course, Tony uses the time to get her, her like a low blow. I guess you could say, though, you know, women don't have anything under there. Oh, I mean, why she even did that move around, but whatever. Hits her with a low blow <laughs> while in the corner away from where uh, RBI Edwards doesn't see her. Eventually, eventually, um, Tony, eventually, our, uh, Deanna would, like, would, like, big boot, um, Tony outside the ring, but, of course, Luther would catch her, spin her around for a bit, and then, of course, Deanna Project would hit him up with a crossbody onto the outside. As much of progress on more, the other chick gets involved, uh, in the match right before, it looks like Tony, right before, or, no, actually, no, 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 Luther got into the ring first to distract the referee while Tony started tapping, so the ref didn't see it. But then, of course, the other chick gets involved there, and Deanna takes care of her, which then Tony used that opportunity to hit her with a pile driver for the win. Good match, man. A solid women's championship match. And uh, yeah. Next up, then we had was easily, easily match of the night. A five star technical masterpiece between Will Ospreay and uh, and and Taka ta uh, ta Takeshita. Takeshita also I was talking about for a second. This, like, I cannot do this match. There's the suplex. Was a five-star technical masterpiece, man. Like there is no way I can do this match justice, so I'm not gonna do. There was tons of amazing near falls, beautiful maneuvering. Like there's this one where, um, 
where Takeshita hits like a hits like hits a hits a bridge, a suplex into a pinning company, and the man did like a perfect bridge. He was perked up there, like he was up so high, like his nose had touched the mat. Man, beautiful bridge he had there, man. So many close near falls, so many counters. Like there was one where, like, oh, uh, where uh, oh, with Will Osprey. This is probably the highlight match for me. Will Osprey goes for a uh, Oz cutter, and then <laughs> Takeshita tra counters it into a. Um, uh, Falcon's arrow man for a near fall man like I legit thought the match was over there so many other ones like there's one where he like grabs him up where, where um, Okada is on the, sitting on the top rope and then uh, Takesh picks him and then drops him right back down there on a uh, back first onto the turnbuckle man Oof, that one looked nasty so many amazing spots but anyway Will Ospreay would eventually get the match with the hidden blade and yeah, then this other guy would come in there. I have no idea who he is. Uh, I don't know if he's if if it's this Kyle Fletcher guy that's been facing at the new uh, at next week's Dynamite, which of course you guys and they have a new a new logo and everything, man, which looks good. But I don't know, man. Like it's probably the whole thing. Like you people hate Shane's thing, but it's an overall really good logo. I like it, but it's like I don't know. I kind of prefer the old one. But I'm sure once this happens for a few weeks, I'll for uh, it's not like I don't hate or nothing, but it's just like. Why change what, what doesn't need to be changed, you know? But it's a nice logo, man. I really dig the look of the logo, man. But uh, I'm definitely going to miss the old logo, man. I'm definitely going to miss it. Next up was the main event between Samoa... Or not the main event, or I guess the co-main event, if you want to call it that. Between Samoa Joe, Swerve, and and Paige for the AEW Championship. First of all, am I going insane or wasn't it on Dynamite that Paige announced he wasn't cleared to compete for the match at Revolution? Am I misremembering? Am I going crazy? I could have sworn he said he wasn't cleared to compete for the match, but yet here he is. Whatever. Maybe it was all storyline, or maybe they had, or maybe it wasn't as bad as they initially thought it was. I don't know. Whatever the case may be, he's back for the match. And this was an incredible match. This is probably my second favorite match on the card, man. I love this match. Full of near falls, full of batshit insanity, man. Mostly between Swerve and, um,. And, uh, and, uh, uh, between Swerve and Paige, man, especially. Joe was, of course, doing his thing, man. You know, going in there, doing his thing. But that was the main story was between these two, man. Like, you had Hangman going in, grabbing the belt, smashing it over Swerve, and then just starts talking to you, like, you will never get this championship. You will never get this title. And then... <laughs> Probably the most craziest fun of all was when the ref or was when <laughs> Swerve goes for the pin on Joe and Hangman and the and Joe kicks out, which I wonder if this might have been like a miscue or not, because it looked like it might have been given how it turned out. Where then Paige grabs the ref, pulls him like really hard, just like yeets him outside into outside the ring onto the floor. You know, after he already kicked out, which made me think of this, if he was supposed to break on the pin this way, but maybe they missed cued and so Joe ended up kicking out before him. Whatever the case may be, throws him out to the outside, gets in there, hits the buckshot lariat. One, two, three, four, five, etc. Et the other ref finally comes in there. One, two, Two, of course, Swerve kicks out. Paige is furious at this ref, man. He is screaming at the ref, like, two, two, it was a two. <laughs> and then the whole other time, for a while, he, like, sets up for the buckshot again. I think he's going to go for the ref. <laughs> Honestly, the man was furious. But he ends up hitting... <laughs> he ends up hitting Swerve with it. And then... <laughs> I think he pins him again and once again got a near fall. I forget exactly what. Regardless, this man just starts beating up. Or no, 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 no. He breaks up the pin that Swerve was going for. And then he just starts wailing and beating on the ref. And throws him over the top rope for his troubles. Man was absolutely losing it, man. Oh my god, this match this match was insane. Like I said, man, this match was insane. Anyway, Swerve locks in the Karafuda clutch and ends up winning the match when while while Swerve was like crawling over him to try and break it up, but Paige tapped out before he could because he wanted to make sure he doesn't get that goddamn championship. Amazing match, man. I hope we I need I hope we get more I'm I'm curious to see where the storyline between Swerve and Paige is gonna keep going and man where it's gonna go next man because this has been this has been incredible television if you ask me, man. And then finally we had the actual, I guess you can call it main event, which is of course Sting's retirement match. This was fantastic in its own way, man. You had this little video package with Sting, you know, reliving some of his career moments throughout his time in WCW. You had his kid, you had Ric Flair was there. Uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat was there at ringside as well. His kids were joining him alongside Dress Up.